Good week so far. We have uh, a flock of birds today, uh, ones that show up in uh, eastern Washington at least uh, in the winter months. These are bohemian waxwings. They flock on down to trees where there's food, like this crabapple tree, uh, but they're uh, you know, birds, there are lots of things that eat, eat birds, so they are very aware of kind of what's going on around them and, and fly away uh, if they think there is danger. But when you have this many birds together, as soon as one of them gets worried and starts flying away, the whole flock takes off. And so you'll see like 50 or more birds come to a tree, be there for two seconds before one of them like thinks there's a problem and then they all fly back up. So it can be be hard for the birds to actually get, get a bite to eat. Christian? What angle is this picture taken from? The one of the birds are like upside down. So, uh, so the, the ground is toward the bottom of the picture. Okay, so the birds, the birds are just at all sorts of different angles. Okay. Uh, so here's, here's a closer look at, at a bohemian waxwing. It uh, is making a valiant attempt to eat a crab apple uh, and tries, it's almost got it, but no. <laughs> loses, loses a crab apple, sad bird. Uh, but, you know, there's many more where that came from. All right, that's our bird. Uh, what questions do you have about uh, sockets, networking, uh, anything we've been we've been looking at. All right, one, yeah, Jade. Will we be learning information next week? The information from uh, the classes through Monday will be applicable to the lab. Uh, um, yes, I'd be happy to review quiz stuff on, on Friday. Um, yeah, so if you if you send me an email, we can, we can do that. Uh, other questions? One uh, reminder. Uh, uh, about the, the lab grading. Uh, the auto grader is always the minimum score you can earn on the lab. Uh, and of, uh, evidence that you have worked on and thought about the problem that we're trying to solve, that can earn partial credit. And uh, leaving comments in the code about what bugs there are, what you have tried, um, is a good way to help us give you partial credit. So if this is news to you, I did say this first day of class, but it's been a while, uh, and you would like to include some of these comments, it's fine if you go ahead and resubmit uh, uh, the Malik Lab today. Um, but uh, keep, keep that in mind. Um, any questions about that? Yeah. Well, let's say we had a lab that tried that like, completely exploded in a lot of effort. It doesn't work, so we submitted the version that works. Could we submit the version that also doesn't work? Because like, we need a lot of work, but it doesn't work. Yes, that's fine. You could submit both, say, a working implicit free list, and here's what we tried on an explicit free list, and or whatever it was, with some commentary about, like, what you think the problems are, or what wasn't working about it, things like that. Other questions? <coughs> All right, the, our final lab, uh, lab five, is now posted. And uh, well, as uh, I said, we'll be talking about things related to this lab over the next few days. Uh, so first is to pick up uh, where we left off on Monday with uh, web servers, where <coughs> we
We have some kind of web client. This is often a web browser like Chrome or Safari or Firefox or uh, Microsoft Edge, God help you. And we have some web server like uh, carlton.edu or mantis or amazon.com. And our clients sending an HTTP request to our web server and the web server sends back an HTTP response which includes the content, the, the web page, the image, uh, whatever it is that uh, was, was requested. This is this is taking place at least typically over a TCP connection. So a client and the web server using uh, sockets establish a TCP connection, and then this that is what is facilitating this transfer of, of HTTP. Request and response. The content that the client is looking for is identified by a URL uh, a uniform resource locator is our www.amazon.com. That's our URL to identify the site we're, we're looking for. Uh, within a particular server, you might specify uh, some particular file in there or service that you are looking for. So an example would be We have www.carlton.edu, and if we want the computer science department page kind of within that server, we say slash computer science. So we're specifying the, uh, the server, which is going to be translated to some IP address. Uh, that we're trying to connect to. <coughs> and after that, we have the file or resource or service um, that we are requesting from the server. And if we don't have anything here, the server has some default content that it replies with, like an index.html um, uh, or, or something like that. Questions on this so far? So, when this content comes back, our client might need to know what kind of content is this. Is it text? Is it image? Is it video? Uh, things like that. And uh, this is communicated via the mind type. When I tell you what uh, MIME stands for, it's not going to be any better. Uh, Multi-purpose internet, good so far, mail extension. 
So this acronym is some historical vestige where we needed to tell some uh, uh, male program what kind of thing, and this is just you know how this works now, is we use these multi-purpose internet mail extension types. And some examples uh, would be um, <coughs> Text slash HTML is like this is text and specifically it's HTML. Text slash plain just says there's no kind of special rendering to do for this, it's just ASCII text. Uh, and we might have image slash JPEG or image slash PNG. Uh, to say, okay, this is an image of a particular kind, there are ones for videos and, and so on. Uh, and there's kind of a, just an agreed upon standard set of uh, a dozen or so of these, of these MIME types to, to identify different, different content. <coughs> Questions on that? So there's one part of our kind of URL that I haven't um, uh, haven't told you about, uh, and that is, um, does anyone remember uh, what it is that uh, identifies a socket? Like there are two things together that identify a socket. Etienne. The port number, like port number. Yes, we had our 32-bit IP address and our 16-bit port number. And so if we want to, to point our, our web browser at some specific server and it's using a socket, it needs to include a port. So this would actually be Uh, between our uh, server, our, our www.carlson.edu, and the resource that we're looking for, you can think that you can imagine there being a colon 80. 80 is our standard port for HTTP, and so when we contact this and don't give a port, our web browser is going to use port 80 to make a, a standard HTTP request. But we could put something uh, uh, different in there. If, say, uh, we wanted to connect to a, a, a service that was running on port uh, 8001, it would just be colon 8001. Oh. I think last time you had said that uh, port 22 is often used for SSHs. So I think if you try to go for like www.carlson.edu Let's find out. Uh, www.carlson.edu colon 22 slash computer dash science. Says that we can't, our browser just cannot connect to carlson.edu over port 22. It's not listening for those connections um, or we're, we're otherwise blocked. Uh, if we pull up this kind of network display and connect to, uh, that's not what I wanted. carlson.edu computer science. And we see that the, uh, this scheme uh, that it gives here is not actually HTTP. It's HTTPS, <coughs> secure HTTP, HTTP uh, which means that the, uh, it means that the uh, request and the response will both be uh, encrypted. So to prevent someone who's also on this network from just reading the data that we're sending and receiving uh, from this website. And most websites 
will only let you connect to them through HTTPS these days. Uh, and so we have HTTP, that was port 80. HTTPS is port 443. So this would actually be using port 443 because it's using this uh, uh, secure HTTP uh, uh, protocol instead of the, the unencrypted one. John? I've seen port 888. A lot of does that have like a special purpose or like a common use? Like uh, 8888, you said? I think so, yeah. Um, so a lot like the, for example, Python has a uh, simple built-in HTTP server. And by default, it will serve on port 8000. Um, and there's nothing special about 8000. It's just what they picked. Um, and a lot of, kind of uh, uh, Node.js or other kind of uh, servers you can kind of host uh, easily like this will use some, uh, will host on eight, port 8080 or port 8888, something like that. So, no, there's nothing, as far as I know, that's not a reserved for any particular service. I mean, which is one reason why you can just use it. Other questions? All right, so I want to go into a little more detail about what this request and this response are, because uh, you will need to uh, to use this in writing your, uh, uh, implementing your, your server for the lab. So, uh, the request is going to start with a request line of the form method URI and version, where method is a t the type of request you are making. So uh, the most common we'll see, and indeed the one that we see up here when we went to, to get a page from, from Carlton is get, which just means I'm just requesting you send me some content. Um, another very common one is post, which, is, which means I am sending, along with this request, some chunk of data that the server will need to use. So for example, when you fill out a form online and then submit, that will generate a post request, which will send the things you put in the form to the server as part of the, the HTTP request. And there are several others. Uh, uh, but get and, get and post are, are by far the, the most common ones we'll encounter. Uh, this URI, yeah. uniform resource identifier is a more general form of a URL. So uh, a URL, uh, will be um, uh, like one of these kind of uh, addresses on uh, the internet, or your I could be one of those, or could be a path to a local file on our machine, or kind of, uh, it's a, a kind of broader category of, of ways we could specify the request. And then our version, which I'll write over here, is just telling the server uh, there are different versions of HTTP, and we need to tell the server like what version this request is using so it knows how to process it. So it could be HTTP slash 1.0, HTTP slash 1.1, uh, if we uh, look at 
uh, this table here, under this protocol uh, column, we see a bunch of these say H2, which is HTTP2. We see some that are HTTP1, um, or even HTTP3 uh, is uh, a recent, recent development. Uh, but it's just literally that kind of one of these three things telling the, uh, telling the server this is uh, how to interpret, uh, interpret this request according to this one of these standards. Uh, Etienne? Oh. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Christian? Um, why would one of them still be one by one and then like the rest two and then one and three? So, uh, it might depend on, uh, not all these requests are being generated in the same way. So some of them, like this fonts.css, uh, uh, may be requested by some JavaScript library that is running on the page. And so it might generate a request in one of these, while the browser formats the request according to a different one, uh, so that is what I would expect. The reason there are differences is they're actually being generated by different code or, or, or programs. Um, but that's just my, my guess. I have not kind of dove in and looked at where is this fonts.css being requested and why might that be 1.1? 1 .1? Other questions? Nina? Yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't have different was like give solved examples of why like why are the provisions? Uh, so basically, there are they there are more uh, sophisticated information or detailed information that uh, the client can send to the server in these later versions. So. To look at a, an example, which I wish there was a way to make this bigger. Um, but this, if we look at these request headers, there's uh, something telling it uh, what kind of MIME types the client will accept, uh, what kind of encoding, what kind of compression the client will accept, what sort of language. Uh, uh, things about the, the browser version, uh, the operating system, and a lot of these different uh, uh, pieces of information that the client can send along were not implemented in 1.0 and have been added by these later standards. John? Are the standards not like backwards compatible per se, like this three not have all the functions of the one? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, because the client is telling the server which version it should expect in this request, uh, the server can uh, parse and, and, and process as appropriately. Uh, I don't know if code that processes an HTTP2 request could unchanged process all requests that conform to the HTTP 1 standard. Uh, my guess is 2 will, will like require things that a 1.0 wouldn't provide, so that you would actually kind of need to know which version you're processing. Other questions? Oh. What's the like, compatibility between the standards? Like, is it like the standards are only in the HTTP, but the server doesn't understand it? Is there like a way to say, you can only be uh, yes, the server will send back something saying, I don't understand this request. Maybe, uh, uh, and, and we'll get to, to how it might communicate that in a moment. So, as I, we've sort of seen on the screen here, there are these things called headers, and some of them come along with the request, and these are the lines that come after our request line. So they're all of the form a header name followed by a colon followed by a header value. 
So uh, one that is uh, used in HTTP uh, 1 and 1.1 1 .1, uh, is uh, a host header that just tells the web server, this is the, the host that I'm trying to connect to. So it might be host colon www carlson.edu. And uh, once all, once the client has sent all the headers that it's going to send, it will uh, have a blank line, which in HTTP is our carriage return uh, new line. So a blank line of these tells the server, okay, the request is finished. You've seen the request line in all the headers that I'm going to send. And at that point, the server knows it should process the request and then start sending information back. What is the information that it's sending back? Response line that kind of starts the response, uh, like we had a request line that starts the uh, uh, request. This one starts with the version. Has a status code. and then a status message. So that information is actually shown uh, up at the top of our Chrome uh, uh, developer tools here that our status code uh, is 200. So an example is it sent this back as, let's say, HTTP 2. The status code was 200, and the message that goes along with that is, okay, things went well, the request was satisfied. Uh, other ones we might see are 301. Uh, which says, this content has been moved. It was at this address, but it's no longer there. You should use this other address. Uh, you've probably seen uh, 404, it says the content you requested is not there. Um, question of uh, what happens if we send the server a request that doesn't match the standard or, or has some problem with it, we're going to 400 for bad request, and there are many, many different different status codes that a server could get back to tell us different things about what uh, what happened. Uh, Elliot. So 200 is OK, but like, how does it actually send the content back? Yeah, so this is just the start of our response. This is just the start. Um, so after the response line, we'll have Uh, some response headers, and these follow the same header name colon header value uh, that the request headers did. Uh, some, the kind of two uh, very important ones uh, would be content type. That's going to tell us the mind type of the content we're sending back. So something like content type text slash HTML is telling the client, I'm sending you an HTML file. Uh, another one would be content length. Uh, I am sending you an HTML file that's 324 bytes. 
So this is how much data you should you should uh, expect as once uh, you start reading the actual content. So like our request, we have some headers. We then have a blank line to indicate this is the end of the headers, and then. the response body, the actual 324 bytes of HTML text would follow after this blank line. Silence. So does all the rest of the stuff, like the CSS and the JavaScript that comes along, would that be, would those all have their own get requests as well? Yes. Uh, all, the, all the separate files, uh, uh, and when we can see Chrome showing us that, that requested the basic resource, and then at, that was the first thing that happened, and then after that, all these different requests for CSS, for JavaScript files, for images kind of came in and they were all processed in the same, like send an HTTP request, get the content back. Um, and so basically as the browser rendered, was, was taking the HTML and giving us this page, kind of it kept encountering within the page some other resource that needed to be displayed and that generated a request to go get that image or go get um, that uh, CSS file that is embedded in the, in the page. All right. When you do like a post request, is there the value of posting that to be in the headers or those are the requests that follow the Yeah, that would be, a, uh, there would be a body to the, to the request and um, I think the request would, would include kind of how much content it was sending as part of the post request. All right, so one quick demo of, um, uh, that lets us see this in, in action. Make this, uh, this is fine. Uh, so there's a tool called Telnet, which we can use to, uh, you know, that's just too small. Let's go big. Tool called Telnet that we can use to uh, connect to a particular uh, uh, server on a particular port, connected to this IP address, uh, and then I can just type in my HTML or HTTP uh, request. So if I say get the root HTTP slash 1.0 and then a blank line to end the request, it will uh, tell that sends that request to the server and uh, we get back our uh, response line, response headers, blank line, and then all the HTML for that page. Like that's uh, literally what the uh, uh, what our our client in this case, this Telnet program, and the server, this w3.org, uh, sent back and forth. I chose w3.org carefully because it's uh, one of a shrinking number of web pages that still accepts HTTP requests as opposed to requiring the secure encrypted HTTPS. So if I tried this uh, telnet with uh, carlton.edu uh, on port 80, get uh, uh, HTTP slash 1.0, uh, it can't, it won't get me the, the root uh, directory, but I know there's a slash index.html that does that you can uh, load. Uh, I think Apparently, it has decided to be sad. <laughs> no.
But if we want to see the, um, there is a way uh, uh, to to get a like content has moved back from uh, from Carla. I think I would have needed to provide the host header, uh, but there's a different utility we can use to connect over this uh, HTTPS. And what we see is this all this stuff about the client and the server agreeing on how the data is going to be encrypted so both sides can, can decrypt it and, and are able to read it. Uh, so now if I said get uh, slash HTTP slash 1.1 uh, host, I need to tell it calls.edu, uh, I get back a bunch of uh, uh, actually compressed data and so it's showing is just it's trying to render the compressed bytes as like ascii text and it shows up as all this all this garbage but a web browser knows how to you know uncompress the data that's sent back and actually display it to you um all right last thing i want to say about web servers is to change this picture to incorporate a kind of useful uh, tool that you will actually be implementing in the upcoming web. So in this picture, we have our client, we have our server, but we're introducing a stop in the middle that we'll call a proxy. Proxy often means something that stands in for something else or acts as something else. Uh, and in this case, our client will send a request to the proxy. Our proxy will forward that request onto the server. The server processes it, sends the request back to the proxy, which then sends it back to the client. So you might wonder, why would we want to just introduce this thing in the middle? Wouldn't that just make everything slower? And there would be some cost to it. Uh, but one thing we might do is uh, cache data in the proxy. So that would mean when the proxy gets data back from the server, it saves it. So if that same request comes in again, it doesn't ever need to, to talk to the server and just send the cache data back. So if we imagine uh, this connection here, is the kind of expensive connection, slow connection to the global internet, and this connection here is a faster, local connection on the network, then if we're storing a bunch of data that we might request again at the proxy, we can access it much faster than always having to go to this remote server. So is that the process that's done when I like, try to load the previous page on my browser? Is it getting the information from the proxy? So web browsers, it isn't a proxy, but web browsers themselves do maintain yeah, a cache. cache it's not um, a proxy. Yeah, the web browser is just in memory, storing pages and images and so forth that it has uh, loaded recently. So then it doesn't have to make a web request to load them again. It just reads them from memory. It proxy any sort of data that it's requested, or would it try to like act like a cache? And for example, if you're trying to load a video, would it try to like buffer um, the next? Bytes. So uh, could we have a, a proxy like proactively get data that, it, uh, that we might need in the future? Uh, in this picture, no. It's just caching what is requested. Um, but you could try and design a like very sophisticated proxy that, that uh, was doing something like, like you're talking about. John. So in this case, the proxy is like. It's like a second client almost, like it's not so much a second server as a second client, or is it closer to a second server? Uh, so to, from the perspective of the client, the proxy acts like a server. From the perspective of the server, the proxy acts like a client. So, so it's just kind of a, a, a middle bit almost. Follow-up question. From the perspective of the server, can the server tell the proxy is a proxy, or does it just see it like any other client? 
Uh, the server just needs a proxy like any other client. Um, is the only, is the read list faster because Client can go to the proxy for the same information that the client server has. Or is there some other reason that this is more effective than going to the client server? Uh, it is faster because in the situation where the, the proxy is physically closer or has a faster connection to the client, uh, going to the proxy and it just giving us back the cache data will be faster than going all the way to the server to get it every time. Does that make sense? Is that what you're asking? Sort of. So if we want to make some call to the server at the start of our code, then the proxy will make that call to the server and the client will make that call to the proxy. Or no. uh, so it, is, yeah, it starts out with the client. It makes the request of the proxy. The proxy then makes that request of the server the server sends back the content to the proxy that then just forwards it on back to the client. And the reason this will be faster is because you might make the same request multiple times with the proxy. Yeah, so the reason that caching would be helpful at all is that if we load that same page with the same image again, we can now just get it from the proxy. Okay. So you're avoiding doing expensive global connection. That's right, yes. Is that like proxy? Who maintains the proxy? Like for Carlson, does like Carlson have a proxy on our network, or is it maintained by like uh, they're not necessarily going to be a proxy on the network. Uh, this is uh, Carlton has some sort of gateway like this because the network is uh, not accessible to the wider internet. Uh, like if I'm off campus, I can't connect to a computer on campus. Um, and so there is some sort of gateway that internet traffic is passing through. So that would be, I don't know if it caches things, but it would be kind of a similar kind of middle point um, for network traffic coming to and from campus. So, Wait, so where is the proxy like physically located? Uh, it could be run, it is a process running on a machine somewhere. Uh, it could be running on the same machine as the client. It could be running on some other machine. Uh, if it's running the same machine as the client, it's not really much different than just caching, correct? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so running on the same machine, uh, the proxy could do things like provide anonymization. It could strip out of the request any information about, say, the geographic location of the client. Uh, it could be uh, handling some sort of compression and decompression as you send requests back and forth. So even if it's on the same machine, it could be providing some, some kind of service. So yeah. you, you could probably have multiple proxies then, yeah? Like you might have one on your machine that's doing one thing and then you might connect to another one that's doing something else. Is that possible? Does that happen? Uh, yes, there could, there could be any number of yeah. proxies in between you and the server that the kind of data is just bouncing around between. Other questions? John? Is that multiple proxy structure how Tor works? Or is that a separate thing? Uh, so, Tor, a uh, service that can anonymize uh, your uh, network traffic, is using this proxy ID, ID idea where it is. Instead of your request going directly to a server, it's being bounced, it's being sent uh, from kind of machines all around the world that are part of this Tor network to make it, uh, to try and obscure where the request is, is coming from. All right, let's do a bit of practice. So uh, first, uh, Thinking back to, uh, to sockets, uh, since all this kind of web server requests and responses that we've been talking about um, uh, would involve communicating over a socket, so take a moment to consider, could we use printf uh, to send bytes over a socket? All right, please take a couple minutes, discuss with your neighbors how you're thinking about printf and sockets. 
All right, big uh, movement towards C. That's good, because it's true that we can we can do this with a single system call. Uh, anyone have an idea of what that system call would, would be? Um, one to do whatever topic comes. Yeah, uh, do two capital D is the, uh, the the textbooks version that does some some error checking. Uh, so if we were to look at this in terms of uh, the uh, echo server that we looked at last time, uh, and bring up the the code that actually uh, echoes. If before we start writing to the client to kind of echo back, if we say uh, make file descriptor one, which is the, the standard output that would normally print to the terminal, be the same as this file descriptor for our socket that's connected to the client. Now, whenever we print, it will write those bytes to that, uh, to that socket. So, uh, under uh, uh, this circumstance, you can look uh, if we run our echo uh, server on port 1234 and then run our echo uh, client to connect to it, uh, when the client says hello, what it, the line it reads back is uh, the line that printf printed. And then when it sends another line, it reads the next line that was sent back, which was the second thing, the second line that was printed, which was hello. So now both printfs are just sending data to uh, uh, the client rather than, than showing up on the terminal. John? So is it like a Rio version of printf, or is like a different Rio function handling the actual like sending of data, like it's just the functionality? Uh, so the printf in this example is writing to a file descriptor that is that the kernel has associated with the socket and when anything is written to that file descriptor the kernel sends those bytes over the network. Um, so uh, I had commented out the Rio write n, the Rio function that in the original version of this was writing bytes to that socket and now printf is, is as well both, I could be using both. Uh, functions, all, all of these writing to that, that same file. Other questions on this? All right. One uh, practice on our uh, web requests. If uh, you were to point your browser at the URL um, awb 6633scscarlsoneduedu colon 15213 slash progress, um, which was our, our progress page for, for the bomb lab. Uh, how would that break down into host port uh, and the file slash service parts of the request? Uh, and in this case, uh, we're with have the, the right idea where our, our host is uh, this full uh, AWB through carlson.edu that's going to turn into the IP address that we're connecting to. We have our, our port number, and then the slash is what starts our kind of what it is, uh, the kind of path or, or route to the thing we're, we're requesting from the server. Any questions on that? All right, uh, at this point, uh, we have uh, everything we need uh, for uh, part one of the lab, implementing uh, a, a proxy that send can handle HTTP requests back and forth from some server. Uh, and let's move on to uh, a new topic of concurrency.
So the kind of big picture idea of concurrency is multiple computations that overlap. So uh, as we've been talking about how programs are uh, run on computer systems, uh, can anyone think of an uh, example we've already seen of multiple computations being uh, uh, overlapped? Are you talking about like maybe two two Python programs that are referencing the same library? So that would be uh, programs that are that are sharing memory, um, and uh, but it wouldn't be concurrency if one program ran and finished and then like, another program ran and finished. I, don't I mean, if, you have, like, if the computer is running, it's doing a thousand things at the same time. Like, isn't that all? Isn't that all concurrency? Uh, yes, it is absolutely concurrency. And we've seen how the kernel, when it's kind of deciding which process gets to run, it can it can run one for a bit and then switch to another and then switch back. And so these computations overlap in time. Um, that the, on the kind of visual of this was process A run, uh, if we have time going this way, process A runs, we switch to process B, we switch back to process A, and if these two processes are, are, are overlapping, they are concurrent. So why do we want concurrency? Like, why do we care about this? Uh, we know that I.O. input output can be very slow. For example, reading a file off the disk. And so if process A here starts reading a file off the disk, it's going to be busy for a while doing that. And so it would be very helpful if we could switch to doing something else rather than just everything pauses while the current process is, is doing some slow input output. So having this ability to uh, overlap uh, these running processes mitigates this uh, uh, issue of accessing slow, slow IO. Interacting with humans, uh, a really important uh, application of concurrency. Uh, this is uh, the, your computer is doing a million things, and uh, when I uh, am using, uh, say, uh, my Chrome, my web browser, and uh, uh, Spotify needs to uh, deallocate some memory. Um, I still want my uh, uh, my web browser to kind of still be able to interact with me. Uh, if uh, another example would be if you're typing an uh, uh, essay in, in Microsoft Word and you save it, writing that file to disk to save it might take some time. But user experience-wise, we don't want Microsoft Word to just appear that it's crashed and stopped working while it takes uh, some amount of time to write the file to disk. So if we can have some process handle the writing the file to disk part, while another process handles the user interaction part of this application, then uh, then we kind of get it. This interactivity that kind of actually uh, 
uh, that, that we want out of our out of our computer programs. Okay. Is that something that's gotten better like recently? Because I remember I got, like I haven't seen like a spinning beach ball in like, you know, how long did that that like unable to interact in concurrency with something else or is it? Uh, so I mean there have been a number of developments which may have contributed to that more memory. Uh, faster disks, so computers used to have hard drives made up of spinning platters that a needle would be reading off, which is why if a computer got jostled, one of these platters could get out of alignment and the hard drive was very sad. Uh, and now many hard drives uh, don't have any physically moving parts, they're what's called solid state, and, so, and they, that also makes them much faster. Um, and CPUs have many more cores on them now than they did, so they can actually do multiple things at once. So all of these things could contribute to uh, fewer spinning wheels of death. <laughs> so a few more uh, nice application or motivations for concurrency. Reducing latency by deferring. So, is actually a, uh, you can think of this in a, in a Malik Lab example. So, when the client calls free, one of the, uh, the things we might do is at that point uh, check that lock's neighbors to see if they're free, to see if we want to coalesce them together before our free function completes. So, this is sort of extra coalescing work that every call to free has to do. But if we could have something running in the background that whenever the system is idle, this background thing starts checking through the heap to see if there's anything to coalesce. Now our free function, all it needs to do is to like notify this background thing, um, or maybe it doesn't need to do anything. Uh, free can just mark the block as free and immediately return and rely on this background thing to take care of the, of the coalescing sometime later. So by kind of deferring the work to, to something that's going to happen later, we can have a, the kind of current operation finish faster, which is this reducing latency piece. Finally, as is uh, highly relevant to what we've been, been talking about, Concurrency would allow us to serve multiple network clients. So consider consider our our Echo server, uh, where as it's currently designed. Uh, here's our server. And we have some client one. And client one connects to the server. Uh, the server calls accept, where it was waiting for a connection. Accept uh, returns after this connection. The server uh, goes to read uh, input from, from the client, which the client uh, wrote. Then it echoes it back. Where the client read a uh, called read to, to read that, that uh, data back from the server, that return, uh, and then the user goes to lunch. <coughs> Client one is still running, connection is still active, and so uh, server server is stuck waiting for the client's input. 
Meanwhile, client two over here connects and uh, then it's just sitting there waiting. The server will not accept this connection until this echo function where it's just going back and forth with the first client until that's done. So until this user closes this connection, all other clients are just out of work. They can't get anything out of the server. And so that's why we'd really like our server to be able to, to be concurrent, to be able to overlap uh, uh, handling different requests in order to avoid this problem where it's just stuck, uh, uh, waiting for some, for some client that's, that's out to lunch. Does that make sense? Questions on this? John? In, in the concurrent version of this, how does the server like check for when client one comes back? Like, is it can it just pause the process and instantly recognize when it's been sent a new thing, or does it have to like pull some kind of memory base or something to determine whether or not it's been sent something? So, how does our server actually handle these requests concurrently? Is uh, Kind of the, the 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 main question here. Like this is what we're trying to trying to figure out. So one uh, one way that we could do this is do what's called process based concurrency. That is, we're going to create new processes to handle each client. So what that means for this picture is that when our server um, accepts the connection from client one, it's then going to call fork which we talked about earlier as something that creates a new process that's running the same code as the original one. The server kind of clones itself, has this new process, and that sort of splits off, and that's what is handling the connection from client one. And this means that when client two connects, the server the parent process is still around to accept, then call fork, then this second process that it kind of split off from itself, this is what is handling the connection we're applying to. So it's every time we get a connection, we're going to kind of spawn or create a new process that will be just for handling the reads and writes from a particular client. So now the original server is still, is still always available to accept a new connection and then split off yet another uh, process to handle it. Silas? Is this the way that, like, I can't remember the name of them, but the tax in which you just make endless requests to the server at work and it just too many times? Uh, so uh, denial of service attacks. Um, yeah, uh, one of the ways that they work is you make so many requests of the server that some part of it breaks. Um, maybe it kind of, you create so many separate processes that it uses too much memory, or uh, maybe it uh, hits the limit of the number of file descriptors a single process can have open. There's, there's a number of things that, that, could, uh, that could be tripped when you, when you overwhelm uh, a server, but, um, yeah, when you're sending tons of tons of requests, you're just kind of increasing its use of resources in some way to the point where it, it falls over. Right. Isn't this just kind of pushing out the problem of concurrency? Like now our server is concurrent, but somewhere closer to like the core or whatever is still trying to handle multiple processes right at the same time. Right. So 
we are relying on the fact that the kernel is sort of choosing which process runs when, and we're also relying on the fact that it's not going to be mean about it, and it's going to, going to let everyone have a turn. Um, that if our kernel decided, no, this child process just never gets any CPU cycles, then yeah, there's not much we can do. Um, but as long as the kernel keeps kind of doing some approximately fair switching between all current processes, uh, these child processes will get to run at some point and service the clients. Nina? Um, more current is finished, was the process with the server takes back the work, or it just automatically disappears? Yeah, so what happens when a when uh, child process finishes? That's a topic for next time. Um, but yes, the server does need to deal with that somehow. Uh, so I have office hours this afternoon at 4.30. Uh, take a look at the uh, proxy lab, and I'll see you on Friday. Thank you.